Hi, my name is Julian Lucas. I'm a bioinformatics systems analyst at the UC Santa Cruz Genomic Institute. And today I'm going to walk you through a demo of calling variants with a pan genome. Specifically, we're going to be using giraffe and deep variant. We're going to talk about, about why using a pan genome is a good idea. We're going to give an overview of the giraffe deep variant pipeline written by the VG team, which uses HPRC's year one pan genome to call variants for the short read data. And we're going to explore a public workspace that demonstrates that workflow. As part of that exploration, we're going to launch the workflow using Terra's data tables, monitor their workflow's run costs, and eventually we're going to use a Jupyter notebook to explore data from that workflow. So why use a pan genome instead of a linear reference like GRCH38? The cartoon shown here gives an example of reference bias. The sample shown at the top in blue has an insertion with respect to the reference and reads which come from that region will be incorrectly mapped. You can see at the bottom reads which are mapped near the insertion breakpoint, which will have soft clipping. And at the top in red, we have reads which will map likely to elsewhere in the genome causing false positive variant calls. So this shows why having one linear reference might cause an issue. And you can see why the HPRC works really hard to ensure that good sequence diversity makes any of the pan genome. So with that short example in mind, we can think back to the assemblies created by the HPRC here we have three haplotypes or assemblies. And we're going to use these three to show the haplotypes, how they might be represented in the pan genome. In a pan genome, homologous sequences are represented only once. These regions will behave similarly in the reference, um, linear reference and pan genomes. But regions which are polymorphic or different across samples will have polymorphisms represented in the pan genome, where a linear reference would choose one haplotype just to represent. And the graph nodes shown here as boxes represent sequences. And to the nodes, the graph add, adds edges or connections between the nodes. An assembly or a haplotype can be represented as a path through the graph, shown here as colored lines representing the three example haplotypes that created this graph. So to bring it back to our motivational example, you can imagine the green line on the bottom is representing the current reference sequence. And you can see how mapping to a pan genome can improve short read mapping results. Using giraffe in the place of a single reference genome reduces mapping bias, which is the tendency to incorrectly map reads that differ from the reference genome. Giraffe is a fast and accurate short read mapper, which is recently described in an article in Science. Today, we're gonna to see what the developers of giraffe have been working on, namely using giraffe with the HPRC year one pan genome along with a variant called deep variant. Deep variant's a deep learning based variant caller that takes aligned reads as input and it produces extremely accurate results. It produces these results by treating pileups as images, which you can learn from in order to recognize features of other images. So in doing so, it, deep variant is emulating what an experienced bioinformatician does when they look at aligned reads in a genome browser. So in the workplace that we're gonna to explore today, we're gonna to see the results of combining giraffes mapping with deep variants variant calling. A simple flow, flow diagram of the giraffe deep variant whittle is shown above. In yellow are the workflow inputs, including Illumina reads and the HPRC's year one pan genome. These reads are mapped with giraffe and the output bands are called the deep variant. Optionally, users can also input a trained model. In this case, uh, the model was trained on samples aligned to the HPRC's pan genome with giraffe, and uh, you can include a truth call set. Today, we're gonna use the genome in a bottle truth call set for HG3 in the high confidence regions. And the outputs of the deep variant uh, calls are compared against the truth call set at the end. So while conceptually simple, the Whittle has a number of tasks that are required. Before calling giraffe, for instance, there are six different tasks that split out the input reads into chunks, extract the path, some path names, and prepare the reference. Giraffes then called along with one or two other supporting tasks, which are scattered over the read chunks. The output BAMs are then merged. They may have their context name corrected, and then they're split again, but this time over actually a context. The scattered BAMs are processed through seven more tasks, where they're optionally left, al uh, left aligned and indel realigned before variant calling the deep variant. All seven of these tasks are actually sc scattered over context. And finally, the VCFs are merged, calls are extracted, and optionally the calls are compared against the truth call set. So at the top here, we have the DAG from 
uh, doc store and you can see this workflow has a large number of steps and that makes intuitive sense. Um, we're talking about a workflow that uh, starts with raw reads and can produce accurate variant calls from whole genome sequencing. So it's, it's no small task. But this actually gives us an excellent use case for Anvil. This useful this workflow has a number of steps. Lots of them are bursty where they're scattered into 20 or more chunks. Uh, and in the current implementation, one of the deep variant tasks even uses GPUs. So running this workflow locally would be challenging. Using a cloud-based workflow runner sweeps a lot of that implementation and task monitoring under the rug from the user's perspective. So a lot of people working on, like working on a command line. And I, I will say that no one's going to take your command line away from you, but I think it's pretty likely that Anvil or tools like it will become an important part of working in bioinformatics going forward. In the same way that switching from installing tools locally to running Docker containers at some point is advantageous, running tools with a workflow runner in the cloud on data stored in the cloud is the next logical step in genomic analysis. Okay, let's go into the demonstration workspace now. I have Anvil up in my Chrome browser. So I'm gonna click on the hamburger icon and go to workspaces. And I'm gonna search for a giraffe in the public tab. You see the workspace that we're working with here today. The dashboard starts with information about the workspace, including what steps we're running and what data we're using. We have HG3 reads, which are made publicly available by Google and I've imported into the workspace. We have the Minigraph Cactus Pan Genome from HPRC's year one efforts. I haven't needed to import that into the workspace because this is Anvil and we're able to address the version in the Anvil HPRC workspace. We have a deep variant model, which uses a model which is trained on short reads aligned to the pan genome. So I've included that in the workspace as well. And then we have some information about the workflow and the notebook. One thing that's worth mentioning is this is whole genome sequencing and variant calling. So it takes about 10 hours to run and it costs $15 with preemptible instances. If we navigate to the data section, we can see that we have a sample table with two rows. These rows are actually including the same input data but one of them has been pre-run for your convenience. And so you can see the output sections have been filled out. In the input section, you can see the input read files and you can see the input evaluation bed file along with the truth VCF and VCF index. In the output section, you can see the BAMs which come from giraffe and the VCF which comes from deep variant alongside two evaluation archives, which compare the VCF against the truth set. That's the sample table. If you look in the files area, you can see a view into the bucket, which this workspace has, and you can see, for example, the input reads. Sorry. Or the truth set. And the model. One more thing that's here is an input JSON. I'm gonna download that now for convenience later. And we're ready to run our workflow. We do have one more step. We wanna get our own copy of this workspace. And so we're gonna clone the workspace. I'm gonna give it a name to make it unique and press clone. Okay, so you can see the workspace looks the same. We have the same dashboard, we have the same workflow available, and we have the same data table. But one thing that's worth mentioning is that if you go to the file section, you'll see that there are no files in this workspaces bucket because the data table is referring to the previous version of the workspace. So when you clone a workspace, Terra does something similar to a shallow copy where you're actually pulling over the GSURIs and you don't have to copy over all the data and pay for two versions of storage. With that, we're ready to start the workflow. I've pre-imported the workflow to wrap deep variant here from DocStore. And you can see that we're gonna run the workflow with inputs defined by a data table. We're gonna be doing that off the sample table. And I only wanna run off the first row because I don't wanna overwrite the values from the second row. You can see there are a number of inputs. 
Some of them are hard coded in from the HPRC Anvil workspace, and some of them are from our data table. If you ever wanted to pass inputs to someone else in a convenient manner, or if your workflow inputs were ever messed up, you could just actually pass uh, JSON to your coworker or colleague, and they can import that, and that auto populates the entire table for you. So with that, we can click Run Analysis, enter a small note, and click Launch. So with that, you can see that the status is set to queued, and eventually it'll be running. This is a 10-hour workflow, so I don't think we're going to see the results right away. So what I can do is pull in the original version of the, of the workspace. OK, in the original version of the workspace, you can see the job history where we have an example run successfully completed. So if I click on that, you can see that it costs around $13 to run. And Terra gives you the ability to click on the job manager, which gives you information about the run itself. Under the list view, you can see all of the tasks which were run and how long they took. And in some of the cases, you can see a scatter icon to show that, for instance, this task was scattered over 21 different VMs. If you look at the total runtime for this task, it was about an hour. But each of the individual chunks ran in about 45 minutes. So if we were to run this sequentially, it would have been maybe an 18 hour run, but with Terra, it took about an hour since it was run in parallel. Also shown are the inputs and the outputs, though these are potentially easier to look at in a data table. And then you can also look at a tiny timing diagram if you like. So with that, we've run our, our workflow. What if we wanna look at the results from that workflow? Well, with that, we can actually navigate over to our notebook section. So we have our notebook, and if we click on it, you're gonna see that this is a preview only. And if we wanna actually execute the commands in the notebook, we have to start a cloud environment. So to do that, I'm gonna go up here and start the cloud environment. We can go ahead and accept the defaults for now and press create. This takes about two to five minutes. So again, I'm gonna pull out a pre-baked cake and show you a version that's already running. Okay, so we can see that our cloud environment's running now, and I can press enter to start running this notebook. So I have already installed Terra Pandas, just a note. So I can go ahead and start at this cell. If you're not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, in order to run a command, you can click in the cell and press shift return. So the first two things I've done is load packages, which we're going to use. And then I read in the workspace information, which includes the billing project, which um, in this particular example is the CGP Terra Outreach Workshop. And then the name of the workspace, which is dash recording in this case, along with the workspace bucket. Now I'm going to read in the workspaces sample table. And so what I'm doing is using the Terra Pandas library to read in information from the sample table that we had looked at before. And then it's going to go ahead and hold it in a pandas data frame. So you can see all of the information that we had that we were looking through in the UI is now in the data frame. In this Jupyter notebook, I'm only interested in the pre-run results because I want to play with the output. So I'm going to get rid of that first row. And then I want to download the VCF of all results. So I'm going to create a scratch space and pull the GSURI of that archive, and then copy it down with GSUtil. What this command is doing is it's pulling this GSURI down from the bucket, the workspace bucket, over to this virtual machine. So you can see that I can ls it and take a look, and now we've got a tar.gz, and I can extract it. So at this point, we've been using this Jupyter notebook to execute a lot of bash commands, but we can also um, use the Jupyter Notebook to do things that you would normally, you would think of as Python. So for instance, let's read in the CSV for the ROC curve information and get ready to plot it. And we can use Seaborn to make a nice plot. The last thing I wanna show you, which is optional, is to how to upload a new data table. This is a really nice feature where you can take the output of one workflow, say, 
and we've copied it over to our virtual machine, we've played with it. And then if we wanted to run a different workflow on that modified table, we were gonna show you how to do that. So the first thing is let's create a modified file. In this particular case, I'm gonna strip GRCH38 from the contig names so that GRCH38 Chrome one will become Chrome one, for example. Now that I have that new file, I'm gonna give it a destination in our bucket to upload it to. You can see that I'm gonna upload that result to the bucket, updated VCFs, and then here's the file name. So I'm gonna use gsutil to execute that copy. And once the file has been copied up to the bucket, we now have a place for the, an updated data table to be able to access it or to hold that GSURI. The data tables can't hold information from the virtual machine because it's not persistent. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new data frame, which is just the old data frame with two, only two of the columns held. And I'm gonna add one more column, which is the renamed VCF destination. Now that we have this new data frame, I can update it and or upload it to the data tables area. So just take a moment. Now that that's done, we can go back to the workspace. And if you look into the data section, you'll see that we now have a new data table with this renamed VCF file. And you can see it here. So this is really nice. So what we've done is we've used a workspace which is taking advantage of Anvil's ability to pull data from other projects, other workspaces, and that saved us time and energy and money. And then we've used DocStore to import a workflow. We've run that workflow. And then eventually we actually looked at the results of that workflow in a Jupyter Notebook. And that's it.